trust and belief that it's going to work and trust that everybody involved in the process just wants to get to the best work. Be hard on the work, not the people. If you're making great digital work, prove it. The call for entries for the Lovey Awards is open. Enter by the 5th of August at loveyawards.com. Presented by the Webbies, the Lovey Awards was founded to honour the best of the internet in Europe. Think ad campaigns, digital marketing, games, social, immersive experiences and podcasts like this one. Entering your work recognises the team and winning proves they're the best creative talent in Europe. Work is accepted across seven languages, English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Dutch and Swedish. Join this symbol of the internet and creative excellence. Enter by the 5th of August at loveyawards.com. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object Podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative. And this is a weekly podcast where I interview very interesting people from the marketing and advertising industry about their vision for the future of that industry. The exciting thing is I'm on a call with Connor Byrne, who is Senior Director, Marketing Global, Next Gen Markets at Indeed.com. Connor, for anyone who doesn't know who you are and what you do, could you give the audience a bit of an overview? I kind of do. It's a real catchy title that one time, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might. Yeah, this, we really cut into the length of the episode with that title. But there, there you go. Yeah, I'm, as I say, I'm working in Indeed uh, currently. I've had a pretty non-linear path getting me into, into marketing. I actually started my career thinking I wanted to be a chef. After nearly burning down one of Dublin's top restaurants, I decided that was not for me. Specifically, what happened? I left pecan nuts in an oven. Um, anyone in Dublin know Rody's Bistro in their very first summer, um, toasting overnight. And <laughs> back then, I had no way to get uh, into Rody's until the first bus, which was like at 5 a.m. And I walked in and the sous chef was there holding them his hand going, is this what you're looking for? Now, I was obviously delighted not to see plumes of flame and smoke and fire engines outside. So, How long are you supposed to roast them for? That seems excessive overnight. Overnight was excessive, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, maybe an hour probably would have been <laughs> slow roasting pecan nuts. You know, I, always, I actually also used to work in a kitchen slash chef and on the occasion that I did the same thing and burnt whatever nuts was in the oven the sh- uh, head chef would be like what's this and I'd say for one moment in time they were perfectly cooked <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it was uh, it was yeah it was a moment in time and uh, I, I, I then said well maybe I'll be better off in hotel management so I went off and did that for a bit then I then I moved into non-profits and worked in non-profits for a good few years working in a couple of children's charities here and then a US non-profit we we were doing radio fundraising events, which was a lot of fun for a couple of years. And then I kind of fell into uh, into ad agencies. I was I was doing a lot around kind of social media, kind of early adoption, how that could apply to, to the nonprofit world. And then I got a chance to, to work for actually through an agency O2 and help them with their customer service and Twitter. Um, training. So that was just fascinating. And that kind of landed me in, in ad agencies. So I worked in a couple of ad agencies here in Dublin and um, worked on some really, you know, great, interesting projects for the likes of O2 and Full Tilt Poker and some great Irish brands like Bank of Ireland and Club Orange. And then seven years ago, nearly seven year, years ago now, I, w- I got the opportunity to move to Indeed, who I genuinely knew nothing about. Um, and there was a, a job to help run this campaign labs, which is all about testing loads of different things. We kind of had a, a guaranteed budget and permission to fail. Um, and it was really exciting. And I did that for about two years, a bit of brand work. And then now I'm on kind of helping grow indeed in our in our newer markets, which we call our next gen markets. So tell me about permission to fail. I used to be an innovation director back in the day. And if you read anything about innovation, it kind of says that you know, you'll fail nine times out of 10, but it's the one that matters. Whereas if you go to an agency boss and go, I need some budget and 90% of it's going to be wasted, but we might get something away. They just like laugh you out of town. So how did you end up getting permission to fail? Where did that license and where did that budget come from? CMO. Like we had a great leader, Paul Darcy, um, at the time, and he he had belief in this idea that we needed to test, test and learn and fail and um, do it quickly. Um, but that was the permission. Like the permission was he, he you know said, I don't believe that most of the things you do will work. Um, but we have to learn why they haven't worked and, and not make bad decisions about the things that didn't work. Because the risk is if it doesn't work and you go, well, 
it didn't work. We should never do that. You can really lose out. Um, but we had that permission then to try it again. So we were doing things that weren't working. And then we were going back and going, oh, well, like, was the time of day right? Was the media right? Was the creative messaging right? And we we retested all again. Uh, and I remember the first meeting we had um, in, in Austin, which is where Indeed is, is, is based, and we had to present, like, how we were getting on. And we had nothing. There was, like, wins, and we had none. Like, the slide was blank, and we were panicking flying over. And I remember we were sitting in an airport going, okay, well, maybe this was a win. And then we're like, no, like, we're just trying to sell something here. And we went over and we said, we have no wins, but here's a few things we've learned. And here's what we're going to do next. Um, and it was amazing, amazing to kind of really work fast and really creative. And, and again, but we had that, like we were never at a point where Paul was saying, guys, like, come on, like, you know, get it together. He was, he believed in, in, in this approach. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting that stood with me as I go through kind of my, my various different roles. And indeed, you know, I've held that belief quite strongly um, and I think it's important people have that support. So that's cool. License to fail, but you've also got the day job to do and you're testing all these things and you're doing it really quickly. I think someone who says yes to a lot of things, like you seem to be, which is a great thing, that the downside of saying yes is overwhelm. So how do you deal with the overwhelm when you've greenlighted so many different things that have to work really quickly? Yeah. Yeah. You can get overwhelmed. And, and there's a couple of things, I think, you know, one, you know, back Back during that period, we we were really good at prioritization, right? So what were the things we, you know, we felt had the highest impact? And so we kind of had some rating. We we were we were good at hypotheses and building out kind of testing structure. And we'd have a question which was, you know, if this does or doesn't work, what decision would we make? And often we labor over that quite a lot. The other thing that I found kind of really, really helpful, and I've actually only did it again yesterday, is this idea of a meetings, a meeting doomsday where you you find over time that your calendar gets filled up with lots of recurring meetings. And I, I did a count, I think in a month, I had like 67 recurring meetings and, and all provide, you know, value. I'm not questioning that, but some of them, you know, are habitual or maybe too frequent or, or just structurally are wrong because you've like a 30 minute meeting and then you've only a 30 minute break. So you have no time for deep focus work. So I did this meetings, meeting doomsday yesterday where I, went through my calendar and deleted every single meeting that I had, every single one. Um, even people who had meetings in with me, I sent them a message going, I need to cancel this and I'll find a new time. And then I had the list of meetings that I needed to, to reset up and I was able to restructure my days and times in a better way. And obviously, look, I'm looking at other people's calendars. I'm not just throwing stuff on their calendar. That's disrespectful. But I'm looking at my, you know, my days and saying, how can I be more productive with my time that I can, you know, maybe my weekly meetings are all on a Monday. You know, my bi-weeklies are in a certain period on a Tuesday. And it was you know, I've done it before, but like this was liberating yesterday because I was feeling really over the last couple of weeks, reasonably overwhelmed by my inability to get to some bigger projects that I need to work on. And I ended my day yesterday with like a palpable relief looking at my future calendar and going, I'm going to have the ability to start working on some of these things that I haven't had the ability to work on before. And it moves me away from, you know, um, small things often to being able to, you know, support people in the areas they need my help and, you know, clarify things where they need clarifying, but then work on bigger projects that will help, you know, the team and, and the organization in, in a better way. So it was, yeah, it was, it was, um, relieving a relief a feeling of relief was brilliant and how, how often do you put this in if you got like a recurring meeting uh -huh, for the doing the doomsday or is it just a sort of spider sense thing it's a, yeah it's a spider sense um you know i've done it sometimes i've done it before kind of obviously if i've moved into a different role that's a great opportunity or kind of end of year have done it but this is kind of my my spidey sense is going i i need to I need yeah. to reset. Um, and I think a lot of us suit with kind of coming out of COVID and maybe my inability because I'm working from home and, you know, people saying, oh, could you come to the office and meet? And I was finding it really difficult just the way my calendar was set up. So this should give me that kind of freedom because, again, I think there is real benefit in, in you know, 
being back in an office and and, and meeting people and, and problem solving in, in person where, you know, where it's the right thing to do. So in and amongst all of these roles, what is that killer bit of marketing advice that you find yourself sharing most often? Uh, so I, this was given to me um, by John Goldstone, who is, uh, he works with the brand, Jim, who you may know, and he's phenomenal marketer, advertiser. He, he would have been responsible for work uh, like the Hovis Go On Lad campaign and um, the Victoria Beckham posh crisps, Walker posh crisps ad. Um, anyway, um, so John's advice to me was be remarkable. And it's just two words and it's phenomenally powerful because when you're working on things, you know, every single day and, you know, you're trying to get things out the door or improve process, or whatever, like you taking that moment to go, is this remarkable? Like, is this, is this good enough? Is this something that I want aid in the world and to be really, really proud of? Um, so that to me was just, yeah, it, it kind of stops you in your tracks and kind of, it, it, it resonates with me every single day. I have it in the back of my mind, be remarkable. So, I'm not saying I am, <laughs> but just to be really clear. <laughs> well, you know, I think we'll, 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 we'll judge that at the end of this podcast, but, uh, who, who was it that said it on this podcast? I can't remember his name. Anyway, it's coming back to me. Louis Freitas, who is the CRM Lord at Moat Hennessy. And his bit of advice is don't let great get in the way of good or something like that. Or don't worry, don't struggle for perfection. So, you know, the idea is just get it out the door, ship it. You can sort of, you can make it better the next time. And that, I think that runs counter to your advice. So what's your view on that? So if everything's got to be remarkable, then what if you just want to send someone an email about the Christmas party? Have you then got to go, no, no, this needs to be remarkable. Where? Where do you draw the line between being, oh, trying to make things too good? How do you stop yeah. yourself doing that? No, no, absolutely. And if I go back to kind of some of the stuff we did when I started indeed in the campaign labs, like, you know, a lot of that was trying to get stuff out, out quickly. But but even in that, I think there you, you can have, and a definite speed was, was part of our criteria, but you need to have things that you are proud of. So it doesn't mean it's, you know, the most award-winning email that you will ever send, but it can still be remarkable. Like you can still have things in it that you're proud of. And so I think, and look, I think the bigger the stakes, the more you need to be able to say it's remarkable, right? So if you're, you know, right. spending X millions on ad, you know, whatever, you, you know, you definitely want that to be remarkable. But I think it's a really good filter for, for, for me anyway, to be remarkable. And, and look, you know, I, I, I do think that's, you know, there is the moments to, you know, not slow down and make sure you've got pace. And so it is the balance, but I, I, I think it's really powerful to kind of go, am I, am I proud of this? Like, you know, is the email I'm going to send to the CEO about the campaign that we're launching? Like, is it good enough? Like, is it getting across the message I need to get across? That's being remarkable. I think that's okay to take, like, don't send it immediately. Maybe come back an hour later and reread it. That allows you to be remarkable. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Manfest. Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So we are at the stage where we're going to talk about your shiny new object, which is iterative ideation. So catchy title, but what does that mean? I guess to, to sum it up, it is share early, share often, and allow people who are involved in a process, and it kind of works really well with creative process, be involved. So I would have, and I've worked in agencies and I've seen, you know, the, the traditional model of brief comes in from client and there's a briefing meeting where everyone sits around a boardroom table, talks about the brief, client walks out of the room, and then everybody in the agency tries to figure out what the fuck they actually want, <laughs> right? And then the client spends two to three weeks working on it. And or the agency, apologies. And, and, and then the agency probably invests money in, you know, maybe bringing in some freelance creative to bring it to live or whatever. And then there's a moment of presentation, like this, the ta-da moment. And normally somebody's disappointment, 
does or somebody's disappointed. I, I, I heard once a, a, a client refer to an age, you know, an agency and say their work had, you know, just degrees of disappointment. Like it's, it's hard to get it right when you're not in constant communication and constant working together to figure out what, what it is, you know, that, that the, the client actually wants and things change. And I think it's when you go client side from an agency, you understand the dynamics a bit better and you understand how things change. And so being able to, you know, think about that iter of ideation and sharing with people. And, you know, I, I love Ed Catmull's book, Creativity Inc. And he, um, he's got a great, that's the way they would have worked like in, in Pixar, iter of ideation. Um, and he's a great, you know, point about the movie Ratatouille. Right. So Ratatouille, as you know, probably is a movie about a rat in a kitchen. Right. So if you put this into our world, right, somebody briefs you about wanting to make a new kids movie that's based in Paris and, you know, is about a chef. Right. And then the agency comes back and says, We're, it's a rat in a kitchen. Everyone would be like, no, that's an absolute disaster. It can never happen. It won't work. But if everyone's involved in like what got you to the idea of it being a rat in a kitchen, like, why is that interesting? And it's not this gap between, you know, the brief and the actual idea. Everyone's involved going, oh, I see how that could work. Because like, you know, he's a lovable rogue type rat and, you know, all those kind of things that he is in the movie. It just is a much better way of working. And it saves time. It saves money. I remember working in an agency, you know, where we were repitching for an account. And, you know, I remember we were sitting there and trying to literally, I, I recall to this day, we were trying to figure out what the client wanted. It was a new CMO and nobody could figure out, figure out what they wanted. It, we ended up reverting back to older style work. It never worked. They, they didn't like it. They didn't love it. But we, we did it in, in, in isolation. And so it's a very difficult thing to, to, to read people's minds, right? She can't do it. Like if any agency like was able to read a client's mind or vice versa, and um, you know, they, they'd be like writing books and, you know, probably not working actually because they'd have solved it. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenging way of working though. It's a difficult way of working. And what are the difficulties with it? Uh, I trust is the main one. So trust and belief that it's going to work and trust that everybody involved in the process actually just wants to get to the best work. And so being able to be really open um, and critical, our creative director and indeed Russell, um, or sorry, executive creative director, Russell says, you know, be hard on the work, not the people. And that's a great way for this to work because then you're, you're criticizing, you know, uh, you know, not criticizing, but you're, you're talking about the work, you're talking about the idea, you're talking, you know, is it going to work? What about it won't work? What do you like about it? You know, kind of the, the whole yes and, you know, building on the work. And so then that's the hard bit to get to, particularly in, in, in newer relationships with, with clients and agencies. And um, that trust piece is, is really important. So you have to work hard at that. So I love that. Be hard on the work, not the people. Look, that look really nice on a motivational poster. But is it possible? Like, I, you know, I come up with a great idea and I say, Connor, here's my idea. And you go, Tom thanks so much for trying but the idea is terrible and here's like 10 things why like i'm gonna feel that because i came up with it or developed it is it how do you how do you do that how do you not be hard on the people whilst being hard on the work but again it goes back to to being to being early right so give you an example of you know we worked with with an agency in dublin and we gave them brief and we said look bring us back in when you have the 100 ideas on a wall right maybe there were 50 actually they had like i think 150 it was bit nuts but bring us in at that point and then we'll talk about all those little things because then it's not like someone's idea that they own because then and we had all the creatives in the room but they had like 10 or 12 ideas so they weren't they weren't wedded to one big idea that they felt you know they'd slaved over and they you know were so passionate about and this is the only way this is going to work because we were looking at everything and we were saying oh we love what we love about that is this but like, you know, legal will never sign it off, right? you know, or what we love about this or, you know, that bit may not work because of the following things. And so it was more about like that breadth of ideas and and, what, and so then a creative team were able to go, oh, OK, I can understand a bit more where you guys are coming from and then we can filter it down. And here's like, let's come back to you in like a couple of days, like with 20 of these that we think may, and we were grouping them and we were kind of putting them together. And so that's a that's a way of working. We We used to do it with full tilt when they were our client, we'd, we'd create a shared 
doc. Like as, so as we were putting in like, you know, references and mood boards, the, they in full tilt had access to everything. And so they had comments. They're like, I don't think that feels right for the following reasons. So we, you're not going on and kind of feeling, oh, like the only way to do this is if we have kind of this look and feel. That's where you, you, that's where people get invested versus really early ideation. So how would you recommend that someone starts doing this? So you've had the luxury of working both sides of the line agencies and brands. But if you're like a someone who's been at Unilever for 15 years, you know, schooled in the, you know, one of the best marketing outfits in the world. And that way, the way it works is you send a brief, they come back with an idea. Like, how do you, how do you break that habit if you don't have the agency experience that you have? No, I, I would start with, you know, taking that example, I would start with, is there somebody in the group of agencies? Cause you know, probably have a ton of them that work, that you work with really, really well. Like that's the starting point because it goes back to that trust. It's about people, right? Um, and so find that one agency that you have a great working relationship and say, look, I'd love to, I want to try this way of working. I want to try this way where I'm going to see everything as you're thinking it through and expl- you know, explain the reasons that I've just gone through because it's going to get a, to better work. You're not going to waste time and money. That's where an agency is going to be like, oh, I'm not going to waste money. Oh, I like this because it's all, you know, I say I've been there where we've brought in, you know, freelancers and external people to work on stuff that was all wrong. And if I had somebody early going, no, 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 don't do that. I would have saved a ton of money for the agency and like there's tight margins in agencies. So they should love this. Um, and, And so building it that way and trying it on something, you know, I guess, smaller, low risk and, and, and demonstrate then to your business, this is a different way of working. It takes time. Like I'm at Indeed seven years and, you know, we're, we're working this way now in more and more ways, but it's still hard. Right. Um, and, and it's, you know, it is. So it's, I, I think finding that, that trust, I think, you know, reading, uh, I know that sounds silly, but like, you know, Paul Durvin has a great book, uh, Run With Foxes. Um, I think some of Paul Feldwick's books um, are, are wonderful examples of this. He he went through it with uh, the Barclay Cards ads in the 80s. Um, and and Re- Creativity Inc. is a great one to, to kind of get your mind thinking about how this might work. So I think doing some reading um, and then finding somebody you can try this out with, go back to my campaign labs, days test it like test it with somebody that you trust and trusts you well unfortunately connor we've got to leave it there so if someone wants to get in touch with you about anything you've talked about specifically iterative ideation how would you like them to get in touch with you and where so linkedin is great connor Byrne on on linkedin and then i will also mention that's what i call marketing podcast and people can find me there you left it very late connor it's I'm really enjoying uh, following your journey on your own podcast. So where, where's the best place to find that podcast? Uh, we're on Twitter. So that's underscore marketing. And then that's what I call marketing. Um, you know, Spotify, Apple, um, all good podcasting places. Brilliant. Connor, thank you so much for your time. No worries, Tom. Thanks a million. Hi, just before you go... I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object Podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, If you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.